Oh, hello. So here we're back looking at regulation of gene expression in eukaryotic cells. Now, the deal with eukaryotic cells is that they have a nucleus. So by having a nucleus, we can sort of control gene expression in many different ways. So eukaryotes have much greater um, variety in the ways in which gene expression is controlled. All right. So here's a nice image from the textbook sort of showing sort of regionally, you know, where in the cell these points of regulation occur. And then over on the left here, we have sort of details related to what happens. So since we've separated transcription and translation in space and in time, you know, whether it's in the nucleus or whether it's in the cytoplasm, it allows lots of different ways to sort of regulate gene expression. All right, so we begin with just access to the DNA, right? If you can't get to the code, you can't transcribe it. So how does that work? Well, um, if you recall, DNA wraps around those little histone proteins. So here we see the histones in purple and the DNA is in blue. So if you add acetyl groups to the tails, the little green dots that we see here, if you add acetyl groups to the tails of those histones, it unwinds the DNA and that provides greater access to uh, the, the code within the DNA molecule, okay? So uh, again, adding acetyl groups uh, opens up the, the DNA. I just think acetylation provides access, right? And so certain regions of the DNA are coiled up. That's called heterochromatin. Since it's packed in tightly, transcription doesn't really happen. And then in areas where the DNA is less tightly bound, that's euchromatin, that's the good stuff, uh, the code is more accessible and the DNA can uh, be transcribed. Uh, now, one thing that's a little weird is sometimes uh, these acetylation um, patterns that occur in DNA, so regions that are sort of coiled up or uncoiled, that can be passed on from parent to offspring. So things that can happen during a person's lifetime can actually influence whether those genes be expressed in their offspring. Uh, now, acetylation provides access. We've already talked about what methylation does. If you add methyl groups to the DNA, it coils up, like what you see in VAR bodies in the X chromosomes of females. Uh, so with methylation, you are shutting down certain regions of the DNA. So you shut down different genes. So again, acetylation gives access. Methylation causes it to coil up. Uh, so again, that gives you a chance to sort of influence whether or not uh, genes will be expressed. You can inherit them, but whether or not they're used to make something depends on stuff like this. All right. Well, let's say transcription happens. Uh, for transcription to occur, you actually need a lot of pieces of the puzzle in place. Okay. So again, before the, the play can begin, all the actors have to be present. Uh, now, what we're, we focus on up to this point is sort of the, the part of the DNA that can be transcribed. So here we see the promoter where the RNA polymerase attaches. You see the introns and the exons, the areas that will get cut out and stitched together. And then, you know, we've got the five prime cap and the poly A tail. But remember, genes only make up about 1% of your DNA. There are regions outside of genes that influence transcription. And so these are uh, these enhancer regions uh, or control elements. Okay, so these are non-coding regions of DNA. So these are before the gene and they actually help control whether or not the gene gets expressed. So if you recall, we said that transcription factors need to sort of get situated in the promoter to act like a, a, a car seat before RNA polymerase can transcribe things. Well, what do the transcription factors dock on? What are they attached to? Well, it turns out uh, there are regions of DNA, again, they call them enhancers here, and you see these little proteins, they're called activators. <laughs> the activators have to dock on the DNA and then the transcription factors can attach to that. So you can imagine if you change the DNA, if you mutate the DNA uh, in these enhancer regions, that's not the gene itself. But if you change the DNA, these activators may not attach. If these activators don't attach, the transcription factors don't attach. And if they don't attach, RNA polymerase doesn't transcribe the gene. Okay? So these are regions outside the gene that basically help situate the machinery so that transcription can occur. Even look at this one, this DNA bending protein. This is pretty wild. So the DNA actually will loop around or wrap around in order to bring these enhancers uh, into position so that you can transcribe this stuff. 
Now, one thing that's really cool about this is how did you get to be you, right? You're made of trillions of cells, but you started off as a single cell. So what happens to take an undifferentiated ball of cells and get them to become the, you know, sort of multicellular fantastic entity that is you? Well, a couple things. It's differentiation and induction. So a differentiation, imagine a, a, an egg will divide into two and then into four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, whatever. What happens is when you divide those cells, little proteins inside of them get separated. So you can have the same DNA in different cells, but depending on what combination of these little activator proteins are present in those cells, they'll grab the DNA in different spots, and then that will cause different genes to be transcribed. So virtually every cell in the body, it's got the identical DNA, right? But different cell, or I'm sorry, different genes are being switched on in those different cells. How do you switch on different genes in different cells? Well, it's these little activator proteins, at least in part. When you, when you have this, it's called cytoplasmic segregation. So when you divide these cells, you separate these little bundles of activator proteins. And when you get different combinations of activator proteins, they switch on transcription of different genes, and then they make different proteins, and then those cells specialize in different ways. Okay. Uh, another feature that happens is induction. With induction, one cell that specializes induces or forces its neighbor to specialize in the same way. So that way you start to get regionalization and, and like tissue development. All righty. Uh, after transcription happens, we fancy things up, right? We've talked about this before. Uh, you make your messenger RNA or your pre-mRNA, and then we add that five pyrin cap that helps um, the messenger RNA dock on the ribosome, and then that poly A tail that sort of slows the degradation or the digestion of the messenger RNA. Uh, another feature is alternative RNA splicing. So the idea here is that you, you know, transcribe the DNA and make the pre-mRNA but you cut out certain introns and stitch together different exons. And you can take the same code, but still produce different messenger RNAs that produces slightly different proteins and that creates some variation. That's really the only level you need to know that. Alrighty. Uh, now, this is sort of wild. Um, this is like what happens after you've made your mRNA, what can happen before it gets translated, okay? Now, here's the thing. Um, people have found all sorts of little snippets of messenger RNA. They're called non-coding RNAs. So these are RNAs that aren't used to provide instructions for making a polypeptide. These are RNAs that actually influence other behaviors in the cell. So the process is called RNAi or RNA interference. So you can imagine RNA is single-stranded, right? So that means its bases are exposed. And so RNAs can have some sort of catalytic activities. So what we see here is that you can take a messenger RNA and you can cut it up. It's with a, a protein called dicer, so like a dicing and slicing. Uh, but you take the RNA and then have it combined with some other proteins. And what it does is it basically has some bases that are exposed and it can go around and look for complementary messenger RNAs and capture them and destroy them. So what this can, in essence, do is silence genes. So imagine in red, you've got this messenger RNA that's been created. It's ready to go get translated. But if it gets captured by these little snippets of non-coding RNA, it'll get captured and then destroyed, and then translation doesn't happen. Okay. So again, this is called RNA interference because these little RNAs can go and capture your mRNA and destroy them. So... Um, We've got a little video on that to watch. It's pretty cool. Every creature is made from a recipe that comes from its DNA, spelled out in chemicals A's and C's and T's and G's inside the famous double helix. So how do you get from DNA to become a real creature? Well, let's take one of those fantastic voyages and we'll show you. We're going to find DNA and well, we'll make it a typical cell. So we're going to have to fly in and then go off to the nucleus of the cell, which will make a beautiful castle, the headquarters. And there's the DNA. Okay, I'm gonna have to actually pause this. My battery's so low, uh, it's about to die, uh, and I don't have it at home uh, here, so I'm gonna have to wrap things up. 
Um, we'll watch it another time. Okay, post-translationally, after you make the protein, you can still get rid of the protein, right? And that is using uh, a structure called a proteasome. Proteasome, I think of it as like a little garbage disposal for the cell. Uh, with the proteasome, you can tag proteins, and then they're taken to this little garbage disposal, and then they're destroyed. That way, proteins don't linger because proteins can become damaged, and you don't want these damaged proteins in the cell, or you don't want proteins in the cell the cell doesn't need. So that can, uh, again, get rid of cells. Or uh, not get rid of cells, get rid of proteins. Woo, okay, well, there we have it. Uh, that is gene expression in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. I uh, hope you have a great day. Take care.